Hello and welcome to The View from Maya Brown Podcast. This is a fortnightly podcast series for employment lawyers and HR practitioners which highlights developments in case law and legislative changes of importance to UK employers. It's presented by Nicholas Robertson, the head of Mayor Brown's London employment team. This podcast is available via iTunes, YouTube and the Twitter feed Nicholas Robertson, Twitter handle at NicholasRobert11. It is also now available on Spotify, Google Play and Yahoo. The time spent listening to these podcasts can count towards your continuing education requirements. And at the end of the podcast, we will explain how to get in touch if you wish to claim credit for continuing education purposes or if you have any comments or questions. Hello and welcome to podcast number 180. Actually, I should be saying that in a darts voice, shouldn't I? 180. Anyway, welcome to the podcast. Um, It's another coronavirus update, sorry, but in keeping with its usual practice, what the government has taken to doing is releasing updates to the coronavirus scheme on Friday afternoon or early evening. I don't know why, but um, we've had an important update on Friday just gone. And as a result, I wanted to do this podcast to make everyone aware of the potential changes. We don't have the details yet, as yet. We're going, there's going to presumably need to be a third Treasury direction, which will um, have to enshrine the particular changes in the furlough scheme to be revised. But we do have a press release from the government. We've got a fact sheet that it put out at the same time. We've got the Chancellor's statement and some limited comments that have been inserted into the beginning of some of the guidance notes that are already in existence. So we've got a certain amount of information. The key point, the headline point, is it's very important to appreciate that employers now have less than 10 days, um, i.e. up until the 10th of June, to um, prepare for some of these changes because we've got a brand new deadline facing employers who want to carry on making use of the furlough scheme. First, it may help to put some of the changes into context. The furlough scheme is now being used by something like a million employers. There are something like 8.4 million people covered by the furlough scheme, and the value of claims made under the scheme is now something like £15 billion pounds and rising fast. When you consider the UK's working population is estimated at slightly over 32 million, this means that something like 25% of the economically active population are furloughed. And clearly, what understandably concerns the government is that if, quote-unquote, only a third of those made redundant when the scheme is wound up, the country is looking at an increase in a jobless total of, what, 3 million in the next three months? When added alongside that to the support for the self-employed under the Self-Employment Income Support Scheme, the scale of the challenge and how you wind this down without triggering economic meltdown becomes starker. Well, the UK government had previously announced that the salient features of the furlough scheme would continue unchanged, unamended until the end of July 2020. And this, if you remember, represented an extension on the original date. Now, the government, up until that point, has said it would continue to pay 80% of an individual's wages up to a maximum cap of £2,500 per month, together with national insurance costs and mandatory pension contributions on that salary. Well, the first change is that from 1 August 2020, the government will no longer make any contribution to employers' NICs and pension contributions. Then, from the 1st of September, the government will, in addition to those changes, reduce the amount of the furlough scheme grant. And this is going to move to 70% of the employees' wages, up, up to a maximum of £2,187.50 per month. The explanation for that figure is that 80% of a salary up to the grant of £2,500, original level, equates to paying 80% of a monthly salary of £3,125. 70% of that salary produces the figure for the government's contribution to that salary of £2,187.50. In addition, however, the employer must also pay a minimum of 10% of the employee's salary that means up to £312.50. This will mean that employers will no longer be able to furlough staff on the basis that, the only, that only the money received by the employer will be passed on to the individual and the individual isn't entitled to any further money from the employer. We're aware of many cases where employers have furloughed staff on the basis that their pay would be reduced to 80% of normal wages. Employers taking this step are, entirely legitimately, under the current arrangements, transferring the full salary cost to the furlough scheme assuming the individual is not receiving total more than £2,500 per month. But from 1 September, that will no longer be possible because individuals are entitled to receive a minimum of 80% of their normal wages up to the limit of £2,500 per month for any time spent on furlough. 
company. It would appear, therefore, that if an employer furloughs an employee on 70% of normal pay and does not top up the additional 10%, then the employee will not have been validly furloughed for the purpose of the employer putting in a claim for that 70%. So, in short, in addition to paying employers' NICs and pension contributions on the wages covered by the furlough scheme, the employer must now pay 10% of the employee's normal salary during September. Then again, there are further changes in October. The employer must contribute 20% of the employee's salary, i.e. up to £625 per month, and the government grant goes down to 60% of the normal wages salary, i.e. up to a maximum of £1.875 per employee. The scheme is then due to end on 30th October 2020. So, from this it can be seen, the furloughed employees, are, what they will receive if they're being furloughed, will remain the same sum throughout. But the amount that is payable by the employer is going to increase by 20%, plus the cost of the employer's NICs and pension contributions, mandatory pension contributions, in relation to um, the furlough payments. So what else is changing? Well, here we come to the, the most important part of the change. The government's announcement is that there is now a key deadline that employers need to recognise and plan for. It will not be possible to put individuals onto the furlough scheme from 30th June onwards if they have not previously been furloughed. Moreover, in order to furlough any employee after 1 July, that employee must have been furloughed for a minimum of three weeks by 30th June. In other words, the government has, without any prior warning, set a hard deadline of 10 June 2020 for employers to decide whether any employees need to be furloughed if they have not previously been put on furlough. It's unclear why the government introduced such a stringent time limit for furloughing new employees, especially given that the overall number of employees furloughed cannot be increased by an employer, as I'll explain below. First blush, that might not sound like a significant issue, but it's not exactly clear whether employers who've been rotating employees on and off furlough for three-week periods will be able to keep that rotation cycle going after 30th of June. In other words, if an employee was validly furloughed for three months during, I don't know, let's say, April. Will they count as a new employee for the purpose of the furlough scheme if they're next furloughed on 11th June? This has already come up a significant factor for employers that we've been speaking to and there's a lot of uncertainty about it. And let's be clear, we don't know, I don't know for certain what the answer is. But there are a couple of pointers which would, I think, support my interpretation that there will be an ability to re-furlough employees who've come off furlough before 30th June. First of all, the Chancellor, when he was announcing these changes, said the scheme will close to new entrants from 30 June. From this point onwards, employers will only be able to furlough employees that they have furloughed for a th full three week period prior to 30 June. This means that the final date by which an employer can furlough an employee for the first time will be 10 June in order for the current three week furlough period to be completed by 30th June. The latest iterations, as I mentioned in the various guidance notes, have been amended to make passing reference to the future changes to the furlough scheme, but without providing much detail. But each of them repeats, word for word, the above statement from the Chancellor, from which I think we can safely deduce it's been pretty carefully crafted. Well, our view is that the former words they are using is more consistent with being able to re-furlough a previously valo validly furloughed employee, but who has since come back from furlough leave. A previously furloughed employee is not easily described as a, quote, new entrant, unquote, to the furlough scheme. And it's noticeable that the 10 June date is described as, quote, the final date by which an employer can furlough an employee for the first time, unquote. Of course, a re-furloughed employee is not being furloughed for the first time. So, although it's important to emphasise that this is just my personal opinion, we don't have the full guidance yet, and this point is clearly critical, my view is that employers can probably still rotate employees on and off furlough if that is their preferred system but we can't be certain. But certainly, for employers who were planning on continuing to rotate staff through June and July, this needs to be reviewed and promptly. In any event, employers are going to have to do some quick thinking to work out whether they wish to continue to use the furlough scheme and who it will apply to. If there is any risk, they'd wish to follow a member of their staff who has not previously been followed at all, whether on rotation or not. Now, that's not the only time limit. The second time limit employers need to be aware of is that 31 July has been set as the last date on which it is possible to make a claim for any furlough leave for periods prior to 30th June. Now, I think it's likely that most employers will now be making claims under the furlough scheme in step with the month in which the relevant wages are being paid to the furloughed staff. 
So hopefully this won't cause unnecessary stress. But where employers have furloughed staff but have not yet worked through some of the intricacies of actually submitting a claim or they're still reviewing calculations, it's worth knowing that there is now a firm end point. The other point to note is that from 1st July onwards, claims made through the portal for furloughed employees cannot cover a period of more than one month. Up until now, the employer was able to put in a furlough scheme claim that covered more than one payroll period. But this is going to end, given the, given the transitional arrangements will start to apply from 1 July onwards and change month on month. And finally, we have a change with no applicable date. The government fact sheet says an employer cannot furlough any greater number of employees than have been furloughed previously. The fact sheet gives no date from which this limitation will apply, although from where it appears within the fact sheet, it seems likely that this too is a change from 1 July. However, whatever the date this applies from, it's another factor for the employer to take into account when trying to plan what use it is going to make of the furlough scheme beyond the end of July. <coughs> The other major change to the furlough scheme and has been what's well, been trailed previously and has been you know widely publicized is the opportunity for flexible furloughing. This is going to be introduced from first of July, which is a month earlier than anticipated, so that is generally good news. The employer and the employee can agree any level of part time working without the employee coming off the furlough scheme completely. But it is important to appreciate the employer will be solely responsible for salary payments in respect to the periods in which the employee is working directly for the employer. This is going to be judged by reference to the employer's normal hours. When this is happening, the employer is going to be able to make a claim for a furlough period of one week rather than three. In other words, from 1 July, the furlough scheme is being loosened up so it permits some work to be done by an employee and it no longer has to be a pattern that is maintained for a minimum of three weeks. It can be maintained and a claim can be put in for a week long period. Obviously, you can put it in for longer than that, but it, it needs to be a minimum length of a week. This, this is well. This is clearly helpful because it increases the flexibility that employers will have if they're phasing back in a return to work. We think many employers may be quite attracted by this, particularly where they need to encourage staff to come back to work, and so they're going through what is essentially a refamiliarisation exercise for employees embarking on the process of coming back to work. But they're scheduling hours rather than working from home or not working at all. Legislation is clear that it's not necessary to submit a submit separate claim for each week worked. You can still submit a claim for a monthly peer or period, but it's simply that the working pattern needs to be a weekly working pattern. In his speech, the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, gave the example of an employee working for two days and then being furloughed for three days. And the furlough, the fact sheet is very clear that employers will be able to agree, quote, any working arrangements, unquote, with previously furloughed employees. So that's really helpful that there aren't time limits or restrictions or anything like that. It follows from the timetabling and from what we've said about the time limits introduced to the furlough scheme that the scope for agreeing flexible working, part furlough, part work, only applies to employees who've previously been furloughed before 10th of June. We've been promised further guidance on flexible working and the calculation of claims for employees who are going to be working flexibly while remaining on furlough. It's going to come on the 12th of June, which, as you will already have worked out, is going to be a Friday. And I'm going to bet you it's a Friday afternoon they release it too. It hardly needs saying that it's pretty unhelpful that the planning for ongoing use of the furlough scheme has essentially to be completed by 10th of June. But the guidance on what is involved in flexible working only becomes apparent by 12th of June. Um, that means that there are still some pretty major gaps in our understanding too, when you actually start to look at the practical issues. The concept of flexible working is less well developed in the fact sheet and press announcement and presumably this is why further guidance is being promised. However, it's apparent that there are a significant number of issues already to be considered by employers. <coughs> First, the fact sheet indicates that the revised working arrangements must be agreed with the employee and that the agreement is confirmed in writing, bearing in mind the ongoing and unfortunate original uncertainties about what constitutes sufficient agreement where an individual is being furloughed, we think some employers may err on the side of caution and get specific consent to part-time working combined with part-time furloughing before the new arrangements apply. But we think it's likely that some other employers will be concerned about this step. If it is a legitimate instruction to send the employee on furlough based either on the specific terms of the contract employment or, more broadly, the duty of loyalty owed by the employee to the employer, then we think it's likely that a return to work on a partial basis for a transitional period would also seem to be a reasonable instruction. Look, so after all, it's a short-term step, maximum of four months. It's less disruptive than an immediate requirement to return in full. 
Um, and we also think employers will be concerned about the administrative burden if they're seeking to obtain the consent of employees to revised working arrangements. And of course, we think that inviting employees to consent to a partial return to work may produce examples where people decline their consent and thereby create more of a headache for the employer. So we think many employers will be tempted to announce that unilaterally they're going to confirm the instruction writing and assert that the requirement to return on a partial basis to work is a legitimate business instruction. Certainly, I think there's less of an issue about implied consent on this way in rather than on I can put it this way, the way out. An individual is sent on furlough who does not turn up for work the next day may be, may be able to argue more readily they should not be taken to have consented to the instruction merely by failing to turn up for work the next day. Conversely, an employee who is instructed to turn up for work and does so is, you would think, going to be taken to be agreeing with that action um, with the instruction for, as, for turning up for work. Naturally, the above analysis um, would assume the individual is not vulnerable or shielding or have some other legitimate reason for not coming to work. What happens if the employee disputes the part-time work offered? Well, much is going to depend on the particular facts, but unless the employee has a legitimate reason for declining to return to work at all, the individual is shielding or is themselves in a vulnerable category. Our view is that employers are likely to be able to instruct employees to return to work on a part-time transitional basis. But a lot will depend on effective communication and, as we have said on this podcast before, so far as possible procuring agreement rather than having to wield a big stick with employees who may be legitimately concerned, even if they don't have the right to return to work. Much may depend on what will happen in the event of such a refusal. Is the employer's fallback position that the individuals will continue to be furloughed, or are they going to be instructed instead to come off furlough to resume all work at the office location rather than doing it on a part-time basis? Second challenge, the concept of normal working hours. Employers are going to need to know what an employee's normal working hours are for the purpose of claiming under the furlough scheme from 1 July onwards if they continue, if they're going to make use of a partial return to work. Will normal working hours include regular worked overtime? What will the period be for measuring what amounts to normal working hours when those hours fluctuate? Equally, how is an employer going to monitor the hours which the employee is working? Law firms have timesheets, don't we all know it? But many businesses have no record keeping of time actually spent by employees. It's probably going to be important where the employer wishes to make use of flexible working that the instruction letter to the employee is clear that the employee should not be working more than a certain number of hours or should be attending work only on a certain number of days per week or some other limitation. There is a further challenge. If the employer is obliged to pay the employee for the hours worked, then the rate which the employee will be paid in respect of those worked hours will be the contractual rate of pay, whatever that is agreed to be. In other words, there's nothing to stop an employer and employee agreeing that the employee would be paid at a rate of, I don't know, let's say 60% of normal wages, ignoring national minimum wage obligations for a second, whilst the furloughed time can be paid at 80% of normal rate so as to comply with the scheme. That would be a matter of contractual agreement, and so clearly it would be necessary for there to be a written document signed by the employee if there's going to be a pay, a contractual pay cut. But employees who are working part, part working, part furloughed might get less than 80% of their normal pay because they can reduce the um, worked part of their pay as a matter of contractual agreement. But what about the situation where an employee earns more than £3,125 per month, i.e. 80% of which produces a monthly contribution of £2,500? Imagine an individual who's earning, say, £6,250 per month, i.e. double the um, threshold, the the, the top salary for um, calculating the 80% figure under the photo scheme. The employer is going to bring the employee back to work by agreement on 1 July to work 50% of the time and to be furloughed for the other half of the normal working week. In July, will the employer be able to claim £2,500 under the furlough scheme per month, which is of course what the days worked are worth under the contract, or will the employer only be able to claim 50% of the furlough scheme grant, i.e. £1,250, because the employee is working half the time and is furloughed half the time? I think this is going to depend on whether the calculation for part working, part furlough looks at the total salary payable to the employee, reduces it by a percentage of working time, which is actually spent working, and then applies the cap. Or do you start with the cap, £2,500 per month, and then reduce that down by the percentage of time actually spent working? Well, the Chancellor in his speech said, quote, 
From July 1st, employers will have the maximum possible flexibility to decide on the right arrangements for them and their furloughed staff. For instance, if you're watching at home and on furlough, your employer could bring you back two days a week. They would pay you for those two days as normal, while the furlough scheme will continue to cover you for the other three working days. So from this example, I think there's a risk the furlough scheme would only be paying three-fifths of £2,500 as a maximum in this example, irrespective of what percentage of normal wages were being paid by the employer. If this is right, I think that's going to be a pretty significant disincentive to making use of the flexible working scheme, because it's going to leave employers potentially significantly out of pocket. This in turn may push employers to give up on the furlough scheme in August, when the changes start to apply, or to refuse to get drawn into the complexity of flexible working arrangements, which would delay a return to more normal working. Of course, this uncertainty is compounded by the fact that the guidance, which, one will hope, clarifies all of these issues, comes out two days after the last date for deciding who may need to be furloughed between the start of July and the end of October. This is not conducive to calm and rational planning by employers. I think the end result may be to speed up the very job losses which the coronavirus job retention scheme, says it on the tin, is there to reduce or delay. So what's an employer to do? Well, planning. Lots of it. In very short order. There are a number of key questions. We're going to produce a checklist which will pop up on the website for those of you who'd like a copy. Uh, Probably won't come out until Thursday, I think. Um, but um, hopefully it'll be of some use. But here are some questions that occur to us if, for planning purposes. Firstly, does the employer have a, an idea as to the likely shape of its business in October or November 2020 and after that? The hard truth is that for many employers, they already know or they're going to suspect that businesses will survive, but in a reduced form. For those employers who are now being asked to share an increasing um, amount of the furlough costs, there may need to be a hard-edged calculation as to whether they wish to continue to furlough staff if they can no longer do so on the basis that the costs are largely or completely being borne by the government. We're aware of a number of employers who furlough staff on the basis that they will only receive what the furlough scheme pays to the employer um, or who are furloughed at 80% um, plus benefits, and so the salary costs are effectively being covered in full. Since those arrangements are no longer going to be feasible going forward, such employers are going to need to ask themselves whether the time has come to start planning for headcount reductions. Um, Equally, employers who have no expectations of jobs continuing longer term have little to gain financially by prolonging the furlough arrangements beyond the end of July, and they may prefer to carry out the necessary collective consultation process before the recoverable schemes under the furlough grant scheme start to reduce. Secondly, employers who do intend to continue using the furlough scheme after, well, in the period July to October, need to look at their existing furlough documentation urgently. It's important to recognise it's not going to be permissible to furlough employees on the basis that the entire salary is payable under the furlough scheme. This may require changes to existing furlough documentation. Additionally, in a number of cases, employers will have furloughed staff up until the original end of the furlough scheme, which, as I say, was going to originally be 30th June. If these staff are going to remain furloughed beyond that date, then their furlough documents may need to be amended and reissued, and potentially consent sought for those changes unless the employer is happy to rely on the argument that it's a reasonable and legitimate business instruction. Employers who've been doing a series of rotations for furloughing staff in order to spread the load need to know urgently whether previously furloughed staff who are back at work can be furloughed again after 10th June. Well, because if there's any doubt, then the effect of these changes may be to shatter the rotational system and mean that employers need to identify before 10th of June who is going to be furloughed for the remainder of the scheme and who is to be working throughout that period. If employers are going to look into the prospects of flexible furloughing, then you obviously are going to have to keep an eye out for the details promised on 12th June. It may be that, that some more information will leak out ahead of time, but clearly given the commitment to making announcements on 12th of June, uh, that I think it's safe to assume is when the main developments are going to happen. I think employers need to think about whether they're making use of the flexible working option, whether it's on economic grounds, or whether it's for employee relations reasons. Economic grounds, business needs to be supported, there's work there to be done. Employee relations, well, it's part of ensuring a smoother and more confident return to more normal working for employees. Whichever one they do, then there's some planning which can now be done ahead of the 12th June announcements. For example, what sort of work can be part, done part-time? Why is the employer looking to have this work done? How's payroll going to operate if the furlough rate for the job is different to the normal pay rate? And so part work, part furlough attracts two different rates of pay. This could come up 
in at least two different ways that I can think of. First, if the employer furloughed staff on less than full pay, but kept working staff on full pay to um, soften the blow that some staff were working and some staff were being furloughed. Secondly, if the furlough calculation for variable staff, assuming, say, the existence of overtime working or shift working, which is no longer commercially available in these more constrained times, the furlough rate might be more generous to such staff in respect to their furlough periods rather than their working periods. How are employers going to monitor as well or limit the, limit the hours worked by an employee to ensure that the employee neither oversteps the mark nor is working less than the employer would wish? Next up, if employers do wish to furlough staff who have not previously been furloughed, then that has to happen by 10th of June. The employer needs to go on through the necessary mechanism, probably consistent with its past practice if it has furloughed staff previously, to ensure that those staff are on furlough validly by 10th June. Not a lot of time left. Employers also need to look at the total numbers of staff who have been furloughed at any one time to ensure they have sufficient headroom to furlough the staff they need to furlough before the end of October. If, for example, the business is seasonal, it's possible that the need to furlough staff might go up rather than down after the summer is over. It's unhelpful that the government has not made clear what date applies for calculating this upper limit, but for planning purposes for now, it's probably appropriate to assume that an employer could put more staff on furlough up until 1 July, and the limit will be set from 1 July. But this too requires immediate planning to ensure that enough staff have been furloughed by 10th of June or 1 July to ensure that the high water mark is set at a level which will not be exceeded subsequently. 10th of July if you're furloughing new staff, 1 July if you just want to make sure the total number of furloughed staff at any one point is high enough. When it comes to implementing flexible furloughing, the employer needs to consider where employers are going to be doing employees are going to be doing the working. If the business is to open and employees will be attending work for part of their time, the employer obviously needs to ensure that its business is open in a way which is in compliance with health and safety obligations. And we've talked about that previously on the podcast. We anticipate that many employers will look at a pattern of days on and days off. Short time working, which still involves travelling to and from the office on a working day, is less likely to be attractive given the time wasted in travelling during working time. If a job can be done from the employee's home, then that at least is not an issue. Um, So people are going to be going back to work, albeit from home. But the employer will probably need to be very clear in the documentation with home workers what hours of work or days of work are expected and what should be counted as a furlough period. In that context, the employer may well want to establish who is keen to come back to work flexibly and who would have to be required or instructed to attend work. One of the things that seems to be quite popular is surveys of employees. Um, and that those surveys are designed to establish what percentage of the workforce would be keen to come back, what percentage might consider it, and what percentage would be significantly um, opposed. It may also help in the context of that survey for there to be an ability for an employee to explain the basis for their concern if they're saying they're not willing to come back to work. In this way, employers will know what the percentages are and where their employees are who are willing to come back to work. It may also be possible to form some sort of generalisation as to the hot spots where individuals are unlikely to return voluntarily. Can anything be done about that? Some employees, uh, particularly if they're critical to the reopening of the business at the resumption of more normal working, may require greater attention to by the employer to understand and maybe overcome their concerns. And to this extent, the flexible working option really just reflects closely the steps employers should be taking where they are looking at a resumption of more normal working irrespective of whether the staff have been on furlough previously or not. Finally, in producing any other further documentation connected with furloughing of employees, it may be appropriate for employers to bear in mind the possibility of a further lockdown. I don't want to be doomy gloomy about this, but there is clearly a significant um, uncertainty at the moment about what is going to happen. We don't know whether the rate of infection will increase sufficiently rapidly that it becomes unsustainable to have people seeking to return to work or to open up offices or premises that have previously been closed. To that extent, the employer will not wish to have not wish to have to go through an extended furlough exercise again with any delay in shutting down its operations. So we suggest that any further furlough letters that are issued now are drafted in a way which allow them to be either terminated, the furlough to be terminated at short notice or potentially extended, maybe subject to consultation or some other safeguards to reassure employees if it becomes apparent that the current return to work in, say, the ending of the furlough scheme in October is not going to be sustainable. So, a lot to think about in all of that, Um, but um, hopefully information is helpful and informed means people can carry on, can get ahead making plans and addressing some of these key issues.
So um, I hope that was useful. Ah, that ping tells me I should be on my next call by now. So um, I hope that was useful. I hope everyone else, everyone stays safe um, and keeps out of the way of this virus. And um, until um, podcast number 181, this has been podcast number 180. Take care, everyone. Bye. So that concludes this podcast. We hope that you find it and others in the series helpful. If you have any comments or questions or want to know how to claim continuing education credits, please email Nick at nrobertson at mayorbrown.com. Thank you for listening to the podcast.